in this video, what we are going to be making is a value scale. Now, a blank version of this value scale is available in the description below. What you're going to need to complete this value scale is, of course, a printed off version of the value scale and a wooden pencil. So, with all your supplies gathered, I hope you enjoy the video on the Elements of Art Crash Course Part 1. The following video has images that may or may not have proper citations. These images are used for educational purposes only. I do not take credit for any artwork and have tried to include proper reference to every artwork available. If this video does not have proper citation of an image or artwork, please leave a comment and it will be noted. Hello and welcome to my first installment of the Crash Course through the Elements of Art. Now this Crash Course actually has two separate parts in it in which we cover all seven of the Elements of Art. And at the end of each section we will have a short lesson or activity for you to accomplish. Now this is broken down into separate sections because there are only a couple of these that are easy lessons to give. And not only that, the majority of these concepts are pretty straightforward and easy un to understand. The seven elements of art are line, shape, form, texture, value, color, and space. The elements of art that we are going to be covering today are line, shape, and value. But let's first begin with what are the elements of art and why are they useful? Well, the elements of art is what all artwork is made of. Every artist will use the elements of art to create art. So that's why they are called the elements of art. They are literally what makes up art. Let's go ahead and dive into line. Line is a very straightforward concept to understand. It is the path created between two points. And it doesn't get any simpler than that. It is literally just a line. Now, there are two different types of line. There are defined lines and there are implied lines. Defined lines are lines that you can actually see. They are there. They are visible. Implied lines, however, are lines that you will not see. However, you can fill in the gaps in between the values of the objects to discern between two different objects or an object in the background. For example, with the images that you have displayed in front of you, on the left hand side you will see define line. This shows an apple that has a distinct black line around it. On the right hand side, however, you will see an apple that is done using shading and values. There is no solid black line surrounding the apple. However, you can distinguish the difference between the apple and the background. That is because you have implied lines around the apple. So let me give you an example of how implied lines and defined lines can actually fill in gaps for you. While looking at this image, take a second and count how many triangles you can see. Do you see one, two, five, seven? Do you even see 12? These are all very common answers. But the correct answer is zero. There's actually no triangles visible in this artwork. And let me explain. A triangle is made up of three distinct lines that connect and they intersect each other. In this artwork, you see no three distinct defined lines connecting. Instead, what you see is a bunch of implied lines creating the triangles. So why is this important for artists? Well, a lot of artists actually miss this fundamental step in creating art. It doesn't matter how good your value scales are or your shading or your form. 
If you still have a defined line around your objects, they're not going to look realistic. And let me give you a real life example for this. Go ahead and hold up your hand in front of your face. Of course, give, you, give yourself some distance, don't put it directly in front of your eyes, but look at your hand. Do you see a solid black line outlining your hand? Well, if you do see a solid black line, more than likely you are against a black piece of paper or you're in a very dark room. But for the majority of us, no, you will not see a defined black line around your hand. And the reason why is because in reality, most of the time, there are no defined lines. In fact, almost every line you will ever come across in your everyday life is an implied line. The only time you will see a defined line is typically on a cartoon strip or in a comic book or something of that nature. If you ever tried to draw something and you wondered why it didn't look realistic, that might be one of your reasons. So let's look at how implied lines and defined lines can work together. In this image, you see actual lines or defined lines coming together and creating sharp angles, which then create the illusion or the implied lines of two diamonds. In this image, you see a cat that is actually implied. In reality, you are looking at one defined line that starts thick at the bushy side of the tail to signify a very thick line that curves up to the pointy thin line of the ear and then back down to the edge of the cat. This is creating the implied shape of a cat, but in reality, it is just a line. Now let us look at one final one. This artwork shows how you can use define line to create the illusion of implied texture. For example, this is a blank piece of paper and looking at this, it is simply blue ink with a little bit of value to create the illusion of the ripple effect on your paper. It also creates the texture of maybe a liquid kind of bending of all the lines. This is an optical illusion on a flat piece of paper using only defined lines and value. So now that we covered line, let's move on to shape. And shape is classified as a line that either connects back to itself or a line that connects with other lines. Shapes can be broken down into two categories, geometric and organic. Geometric shapes are shapes that are easily calculated or recreated using mathematics or geometry. These shapes include squares, circles, trapezoids, rectangles, basically anything that has a really sharp edge and you recognize from math class. That is the basic definition of a geometric shape. Organic shape, however, are shapes that are formed in nature that are more fluid, more freeform. A great illustration of this that I always picture is looking out at a parking lot and finding a puddle. Now imagine that that puddle has some oil resting on it. The oil makes really pretty colors and they're all wavy and they have nice curves to them and they're just very fluid. All of those are considered organic shapes. So it's very difficult to recreate in math and it's very fluid, very freeform. So why are shapes important to artists? Well, as artists, we actually look at the world around us as basic shapes and we break down everything around us as basic shapes. And that is to help us whenever we try to convey it into an artwork. As an example, look at the apples before you. On the right hand side, you might be wanting to draw or paint this still life. Well, you look at this apple and you see, oh wow, how am I gonna do this apple? This apple has great value, it has different colors, it has a stem that comes up from it, and there's a lot of shadows going on there. 
but let's not even look at that. Let's just look at the lace. How are we going to tackle this lace? Where do we start at? Where do we go from? Where do we start whenever we begin to draw this? It might seem very overwhelming. To help artists, we break them down into basic shapes. We know that the apple is a circle. So we draw a circle. We know that the stem is actually a rectangle, so we draw the geometric rectangle. We draw all the geometric shapes, and we start looking around, we're like, hey, you know, that lace right there kind of looks like a organic shape. So let's just draw some organic shapes to represent the lace. Now, these lines don't really mean anything at the time. All they mean is, hey, this is helping us get our proportions down. This is helping us break down the artwork so we can actually draw it. That is why shapes are important. Shapes help artists break down the world around them so they are easier to convey. So let's look at a few examples. In this artwork, what shapes do you primarily see? Do you see geometric shapes or do you see organic shapes? The correct answer to this is you see organic shapes. All the torn little pieces of paper make up organic shapes. These shapes are very difficult to recreate using math, and not only that, trying to recreate them at all is going to be quite difficult. The lines that you see on the white piece of paper is also going to be very di difficult to recreate because they're very fluid, they're wavy, they're curvy, they don't really have straight edges. This makes them organic. Look at another artwork. Is this artwork more geometric or organic? The correct answer is geometric. If you look at the lines, you can see they're very evenly spaced apart. They are making rectangles, triangles, and squares, and occasionally they are making a circle. All of these are considered geometric shapes because all of them are straight edges, geometric, they are easy to recreate using math, and they are shapes that we recognize from math. Okay, let's look at another artwork. Is this artwork more geometric or organic? The correct answer is this artwork actually has both geometric and organic shapes in it. For instance, the pink paisley that you see at the top right is a very organic shape, while the rectangles, triangles, and squares that you see around the artwork are very geometric shape. Before we move on to the next element of art, let us look at one final shape artwork. Now, in this artwork, do you see more geometric or organic shapes? The correct answer is there are both geometric and organic shapes in this artwork. While yes, the majority of the artwork is made up of geometric shapes with the trapezoids and squares and rectangles and triangles, the outline of Iron Man is actually one giant organic shape. So this brings us to our third element of art and the last one in this Crash Course Part 1. Value. And value is how light or dark a color is. Basically, it goes from white being the lightest it is to black being the darkest that it is. And these are broken down into something that we call a value scale. Now, value scales, as I said, range from light to dark or dark to light. Either way, it doesn't matter, but using values, the artist can create depth and form and contrast and can also create the illusion of distance and depth in an artwork. This is an example of using form and value to create a three-dimensional sphere. So there's actually four different methods of creating values. The first one is shading or stumping, and that is wherever you take a pencil and you hold it a certain way, and then you make small circles to create a value scale, ranging from either white to black or black to white. 
Stimping is a method that you use when creating dots. So you create hundreds of dots, and the closer the dots are together, then the darker the object is going to become. Now, stimping is not a method that I recommend unless you are a very seasoned artist, because typically what ends up happening is people get very impatient when stimping, and they just grab a handful of pencils, and they go to town slamming them down on the table as hard as they can, and before long, your very precious art pencils are broken. So, stimping is a method that I highly do not recommend. Not only that, it's very time-consuming, very tedious, and there are much easier methods to create your value scale than adding millions of dots. Next is hatching, and hatching is a method primarily used for pen and ink drawings. Hatching is basically you take one line going from the top left and you go down to the bottom right, or vice versa. You can start at the top right and go down to the bottom left. Either way, the closer the lines get together, the darker the values become. Cross-hatching is exactly the same thing as hatching, with the exception of whenever you make one line going diagonally down to the left, you make one line going diagonally down to the right. Essentially, you're going to be making X's to create a cross-hatching value scale. So let me show you some examples of what these look like. The top you can see cross-hatching, while the bottom you can see stimping. This is an example of shading and stumping. This is an example of hatching and cross-hatching. And this is an example of stimpling. So, your assignment is to create your own value scale using shading, stumping, hatching, and cross-hatching. Now, it doesn't matter if you use the light value first or the dark value first. Either way, it's up to you. The paper that you will be using is in the description. You may go ahead and print that off, use it for yourself, and you can follow along in the video right after this. Here's the paper that we have, and it doesn't matter if you use a number two pencil or if you have an actual art pencil. Either way, it's up to you. I'm going to be using this pencil as an example, as most people are going to be using this pencil. Now, whenever you shade, you don't hold the pencil like you would when you're writing. That is incorrect. Not only does that damage the paper, but it also damages whatever you're working on under it. For example, whenever you are taking your pencil and you are writing with it like this, you're creating a very sharp point at the top of your pencil. When you bear down on your pencil, you are actually indenting your paper and a lot of the time, whatever is underneath your paper. For example, have you ever done homework and whenever you got done writing, you picked up your paper, and whatever you wrote was indented on the table below you. Well, that is because you have a very sharp edge, and you are putting a lot of pressure down on it, and you are writing. To give you an example of this, why don't you hold out your hand and put your pencil down and try to write on that? That doesn't feel very comfortable, because you are poking a very sharp edge into a very tender spot. Now, not only does that damage your paper, and that is not what you want to do if you are an artist, it's also not the correct way to hold your pencil when you are drawing. The correct way to hold your pencil is actually like this right here, where you have your pinky, your ring finger, and your middle finger wrapped around the shaft of the pencil, and your pointer finger resting against your pencil right as it evens down into your pencil lead. Your thumb is rested right on the side of your pencil, like this, and the idea behind it is, whenever you put your pencil down, you are not putting the tip of your pencil down, you're just putting the side of your pencil down. Now this gives you more surface area when you are shading, and it does not damage your paper. 
Now, frankly, the reason why it took me a little bit to get this set up correct, typically this hurts my hand tremendously. This is, yes, technically the correct way to hold your pencil, but to be perfectly honest, it doesn't matter how you hold your pencil as long as the pencil lead is on its side on the paper. I always hold my pencil like this because this is far more comfortable for me, does not put my hand in, into a cramp, and on top of that, it achieves the exact same result. The edge of my pencil is resting on the paper. So, how do you create your shading scale? First off, as I said, we're not doing stimping. You can just go ahead and cross that out because we're not going to do that. That will ruin your pencil and there are much more effective ways of shading than doing stimping. So what we're going to do, we're going to start up here and I always like to start dark and work my way light. The reason why is because if you start over here and you work your way this way or this way, your hand is going to be resting on top of the things that you worked on. And that is going to create pencil lead that's going to smear all over the place. So I always like to start dark and work my way light. So the first thing you want to do, hold your pencil on its edge, and you want to start by applying pressure in small circles as it goes around and around. and you want to fill in this entire square. You can even rotate your pencil as you need to to make sure that you get an even distribution of your pencil lead on the paper. So you want to push down and the harder that you push, the darker it's going to get. The tighter your circles are, the darker it's going to get as well. So you see that? That's pretty dark. So the next one over, you want to widen your circle out a little bit and widen your, let's see, widen your circle and loosen up on the amount of pressure that you are putting down. As you can see, we are getting lighter as we go down you are now creating a value scale. So you keep doing that. Keep getting lighter. Don't push down as hard on your paper. Bigger circles. And you are eventually going to get to the point where the very last square on this paper is completely white. So right now I am barely pushing down on the paper wide circles on it, just barely putting any pressure down. And this last square, I'm not going to put any pressure at all. My pencil is just resting on the paper and I am not applying any pressure to it whatsoever. And there we have a shading scale or a value scale going from the darkest shade all the way to the lightest shade. That is how you shading and stepping. Hatching is right here. And I'm going to start the same way. You start with lines. And with this one, it is typically done with a pen. You can actually draw this like you do whenever you're writing. This one's fine to do that with. It's this up here that is not because this is typically made with very straight lines. If you want to hold it down to the side like this and do that, that's perfectly fine. You can. There is nothing wrong with that. But hatching is just lines going diagonally. That's it. The closer they are, the darker they get, or the darker they are. The further apart they get, the lighter they get. So as you space your lines further apart, you can see that they are actually becoming lighter and lighter. In this very last one, I'm just going to have two little lines there. So as you can see, lines close together, it's a dark value. All the way down here, two lines and no lines. So what about cross hatching? Cross hatching is exactly the same as hatching, with the exception of every time you make a line going this way, you make another line going that way. So what I like to do, I like to start one direction, go down like that, come back up, go the other direction, 
and now you have a cross hatching value. So next one, exactly the same thing as we did before. We're just going to space out our lines further apart. And as you see, it is getting lighter and lighter. And this one, I'm just going to have two little lines right there. And there we have it. Cross hatching, going from a dark value down to a light value. Hatching, going from a dark value down to a light value. And shading and stimping, going from a dark value down to a light value. For this tutorial, you will need a wooden pencil. You cannot do this with a mechanical pencil because you will literally kill yourself trying to get this value with a mechanical pencil. It's very difficult to do. I'm not going to say you can't do it, but you're going to kill your hand trying to get these values with a mechanical pencil. I hope this helped you, and I hope to see you again with our next tutorial on the Elements of Art Crash Course Part 2.